Hi, my name is Connor Delaney. I'd like to welcome you to another episode of MD Insight. And I'm excited to be here today with Dr. Prabhleen Shahal. Prabhleen is a member of our advanced endoscopy team at Cleveland Clinic. And um, well, Prabhleen, maybe you'd start off just by talking about a little bit what that means and you know what your role is and what the team does and, and explain it to the audience. Yeah, thank you, Connor. Thank you for this. Um, I'm an advanced endoscopist with a passion for interventional endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP with a focus on pancreatic biliary diseases. I also serve as a program director for advanced endoscopy fellowship, and that's something that I really enjoy doing. Um, it's a group of eight with a fantastic crew. Um, on the top of uh, teaching, um, I'm also very active in uh, other national societies, and I have the honor of serving as a chair of a uh, women's group for ASGE, American Society of GI Endoscopy, another one of passions of mine. Yeah, I know you have a long list of interests and responsibilities, but so how did you get into the field program? I mean, a lot of people go into GI and there's so many different things you can do within it. Um, but advanced endoscopy, as a surgeon, it's obviously very interesting, but what, what were your thoughts going into it and why, why did you I take think, it? I think that's where some luck and serendipity happen, Connor. So when I started my GI fellowship, I wanted to be transplant hepatologist. It was the, the cognitive and intellectual aspect of that particular specialty that attracted me. Uh, but when I did my first rotation, uh, second month of my first year GI fellow, uh, transplant hepatology rotation, one of my mentors, Dr. John Padaruka, excellent transplant hepatologist, we were uh, taking care of a patient who came in with pancreatitis from stenosed pancreatic jejunal anastomosis. He had PSC. So the question that we asked was, how good is endoscopy in dealing with this patient population? And he connected me to Todd Barron. We started scoping together. And then, well, he said, well, probably you're really good at it. Why don't you consider? So my mentor, Todd Barron, Liz Rajan, both of them persuaded me to go into this field. It was not my first choice, but I'm thankful to them. So within the field, then, how are your procedures? What do you do most? Um, and what areas do you focus on within the field? Yeah, excellent. I, I love, love, I have a passion for interventional EUS, and uh, I think I've been very fortunate because of the support from our surgical colleagues here and leadership. I was able to bring a lot of cutting edge interventional EUS procedures to our patients. Um, one of the procedures that we do routinely now here is endoscopic uh, necrosectomy. A very, very sick patient population with necrosed infected pancreas. This is one of the patient population our surgical colleagues are really happy us manage. And this is uh, this field has evolved. This is like almost similar to first of a notes kind of a procedure. It has been around 25 years. So that's something that we do very routinely here, offer this to our patient, minimally invasive procedure. Along with that, I think a lot of other international US procedures that have evolved and come over the past few years. Drainage of bile duct, creating gastrointestinal anastomosis, gallbladder drainages in highly sick non-surgical patient population. So those are the, my areas of passion, and uh, yeah, love doing yeah. those. I was just talking to our anesthesia team uh, and our ICU team, whose staff, obviously, these MAC cases often are general anesthesia yeah. cases, and they really are the sickest of the sick. A lot of them aren't up for a surgical intervention. Yeah. And uh, they were actually saying to me they see more um, arrests on the endoscopy service than they do in all of the ICUs because, because of sick these they're patients. Sick patients. So it's really transformative. And I remember during my training doing a lot of, I did a lot of HPV, so I did a lot of pancreatic necrosectomies, and I'm delighted you guys are doing them, <laughs> because they're not fun surgical patients. They're, they're really challenging, and the patients are really sick, and there's a lot of bleeding. So so there's there's been some necrosectomy that's been done transcutaneously, dilating a tract, yes. but you guys go transgastrically, ultrasound to find yes. the center, yes, and then put a stent in. Yes. So either we can go transgastrically or transduodenally. Most of the times it's transgastric. Sometimes we do what we call a multi-gate. So transgastric, transduodenal, depends upon the size and location and extent of the world of necrosis. And I think the evolution that has happened in the field of endoscopy, uh, the main one is uh, availability of large caliber lumen opposing metal stents. Uh, they are almost 20 millimeter in size. Uh, that gives a really big conduit for ingress of uh, necrotic material, allows us to go down retroperitoneally, transgastrically, and take care of the necrosis with direct abrasement. Yeah. Now, then you're also doing a lot of. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the US, EUS guided, but the approaches to altered surgical anatomy yes. and to uh, 
um, biliary drainage and gallbladder drainage in some of these patients. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Because Absolutely. it's a fairly new field. Yes, thank you. Thank you for asking this. Yes, again, I think um, we see more and more of altered anatomy now. A bariatric procedure is one of the most common, um, brew and by gastric bypass, most commonly done surgical procedure. And oftentimes these patients get into trouble with biliary or pancreatic ducts, retained stones, the colitocolitis, or recurrent pancreatitis. And uh, what we uh, found and have been working very closely with our surgical colleagues is going trans gas uh, through the pouch or through the rumen, uh, getting into the remnant stomach and then go about doing the ERCP again using lumen opposing metal stent. And uh, the alternative would be going laparoscopic uh, mm -hmm. uh, assisted ERCP, which we still do from time to time. We offer our patients both the uh, options and again discuss with our surgeon and to see what is best for our patients and go about doing that. And I think the other thing would be uh, biliary drainage. It's very common for pancreatic cancer patients to have malignant gastric outlet obstruction. And usually when that happens, they are also not resectable at that point. You know, they're locally advanced or they're metastatic. So rather than uh, condemning them to a lifelong percutaneous uh, tube, I think we can do US guided cholidocodoendostomy or a hepaticogastrostomy, which is, again, one of the uh, procedures that helps them with morbidity in the end stages of their life. Yeah, I think it transforms recovery. Yeah. And I think it's also nice to have that ability for the surgical and advanced endoscopy teams to overlap. And, you know, we can pick the right the right treatment for the right situation as much as anything else. Absolutely. I think the um, getting all the specialties involved, getting the input is the key. It's not a unilateral decision. You have to have the input from your uh, international radiology colleagues, from your surgical colleagues. Make sure you're doing the right thing for the patient. So Prableen, you're also very interested in education. Um, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on future endos endoscopic education moving forward and how you educate trainees to do some of the complicated things you're doing because most programs are going to have a, a very small N to learn from. Yes, I think that's where we are fortunate to be working at a place where uh, volume is not an issue. Actually, yesterday I was uh, gathering all the procedure numbers to update our advanced endoscopy fellowship website because applications have started pouring in. And uh, again, I'm, I was very happy to see our numbers are steadily grow, growing for ERCP EUS, international EUS, use of lumen opposing metal stand for all these interventional procedures. So I think this is where our incoming fellows and all the fellows that have gone through this training really feel um, blessed to have gone through training. Uh, our expertise, um, all my colleagues, they have their own niche and the volume that we are able to offer them. Uh, yes, teaching is one of my passion. I was uh, fortunate to be trained by mentors who really instill the passion and zeal for endoscopy and I try my best to inspire that in my trainees since past 12 years. Um, I like the quote by Maya Angelou, if you um, get give, if you learn teach. So I think in my mind the biggest legacy of a person is uh, the people that you teach. I think that just stays on forever and they go on to teach and be good endoscopists and clinicians and take care of patients. So um, yes, I, uh, again, uh, how um, easy it is, not really wow. easy. I think every person who comes in for training is at a different level, but we take each and every fellow, no matter what stage of uh, training they are, whether they have any ERCP US under their belt or if they've come from after a year of advanced endoscopy somewhere else. And uh, all of us, we try our best to give them uh, the opportunity to learn autonomy, guide them, coach them, and then they're ready to fly on their own by the, I think, little before the year ends, so actually. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's really exciting, and it's incredible what you and the team have accomplished, so it's great to hear a little bit about it. I look forward to hearing more in the future, and uh, excited about what you can do training a new cadre of advanced endoscopists, because, you know, this combination is absolutely the future. Um, of, of being able to do things less invasively and truly less surgically in the future for patients. Yes, so thanks I for all you're doing. Thank you so much, Connor.